Thank you, everybody. <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. Well, God bless you all. Thank you. That was very nice. And um, love this conference. Delighted to be part of this from the beginning. And to see it succeeding over these years is just a source of great joy for me and a source of hope for the church. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, <clears throat> as you can tell, I got a little bit of a cold. So I'll be uh, sipping some little water during this. Hope my voice makes it through the night. Um, I thought before getting to my formal talk, well, of course, have me <laughs> Maybe I could just give you the homily I was planning to give <laughs> earlier tonight. <clears throat> I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, the Synod. Uh, I've been on a bit of a roller coaster the last about six weeks or seven weeks. Um, I met with the priests of my diocese at Lake Okaboji, Iowa. Anyone know where that is? It's a resort, you know? It's a nice little town, and, and the priests of my diocese go there yearly for a retreat. So I gave a series of talks uh, in Okaboji, and then I went directly from Okaboji to Romaboji. <laughs> uh, the Pope had called all the Synod members over for a retreat. So we went to a place called Sacrofano, which is just north of Rome, a retreat center. And we spent three or four days there, listening to spiritual talks and attending the liturgy. And in many ways, the Synod began on the retreat, because during the afternoons, we gathered into these small groups and began the process of, you know, talking through some issues. The uh, Synod began formally, I think, on October the 4th, lasted till October 29th. So it was, um, it was a bit of a slog, I must say, the Synod. I was at the Synod five years ago on young people, and that too was four weeks, and it was tough getting through it. Um, they really work you in Rome, and I, I was used to this. They work you from Monday through Saturday. You get one day off a week during the Synod. Uh, the day goes from about 8.45 a.m. till 7.30 p.m. with a little break in the afternoon for a Roman siesta. But it's a, it's a long haul, and it lasted uh, four full weeks. I'd say most of the Synod members at the end were kind of exhausted. We were kind of worn out. The best thing about the Synod, and I really mean this, is um, the variety of people that you meet. So there, there were bishops, cardinals, lay people this time, that was a novelty of the Synod, from all over the Catholic world. And it, what strikes you is there's probably no other organization on the planet that could assemble such a remarkably international crowd as the Catholic Church can. Um, and that's a, that's a privilege. I remember on the retreat, you'd get your food where there's this giant dining room, and you'd go in and there are tables like this, and you had no idea. There's a French-speaking table, a Spanish-speaking table, there's a Swahili-speaking table, and you just took your place and, you know, did the best you could. But it was a marvelous experience of the universality of the church. I love that about it. The day um, preceded usually with small groups as the main focus. So think of tables just like this, 10 or 12 people. We were assigned in the beginning, and then every week we, we kind of shuffled around, so the groups changed. I was with, gosh, among many others, the Archbishop of Hong Kong, the Archbishop of Vilnius in Lithuania. I was with bishops from Malaysia, from Ghana, um, from Canada, uh, uh, from the U.S., um, from, where else in Asia? There were several, Australia, of course. So extraordinary experience, and we'd be around these tables. We were instructed that you had to bring, as I knocked it over, you had to bring a 500-word prepared statement to the small group. So we had to entertain a particular question. And they didn't want us just sharing off the cuff. We had to come with this prepared uh, statement. And then we read them all around, the, you know, 12 people around the table. And then in another round, we were able to respond a little bit. And then, of course, each table would report um, to, the, to the general session. So that's kind of how the synod proceeded. If you've ever dealt in your place of work with this kind of small group dynamic, that was the idea. 
This synod was easier than five years ago because we were in the Paul VI audience hall. If you've been to Rome, you know where the Pope has his big Wednesday audiences uh, in his giant auditorium. And they cleared out, I don't know, maybe, maybe half the space of this room. They cleared out the chairs, set up these round tables. And so we were a little more spread out. In all the previous synods, you were in the synod hall. Maybe you've not seen that, but it's very claustrophobic, kind of steep the theater seating. And the, it's like the, the worst middle seat on the airplane is where you sit. And five years ago, we had to wear the cassock uh, every day. So it was kind of hot and it was uncomfortable. This time we were told we could just wear the, the black suit like this and we were sitting at these tables. So it was a bit more physically uh, comfortable. I'll tell you, we, we each had the opportunity to see the Pope. The Pope was not there all the time as he was five years ago. Five years ago, he was there at the Synod all day, every day. He's, you know, diminished a bit physically and he just, he's in the wheelchair all the time. So he'd come in for you know, two or three hours, maybe a couple of days a week. But when he came in, we took the opportunity to go up one by one to, to greet him. So I went up and sat down across from him and we spoke Spanish and uh, had a little small talk. And then he kind of leaned in toward me in this sort of conspiratorial way. And he said, now you, you were from Chicago originally. And I said, that's right. And he said, um, I remember reading a report about you when you were in Chicago. He used the word informe in, in Spanish, which is, means like a formal report. I'm like, what did the report say? You know? <laughs> and he said it like that, kind of, and he said, you know what it said? <laughs> I said, no, tell me. He said, it said, you are the new Fulton Sheen. Well, <laughs> I... I say that not to get that applause, honestly. I say, cause I was so relieved. <laughs> I, I thought he was gonna fire me or something. <laughs> I read this report on you. But anyway, it was nice. I mean, he, he does know, I think, about Word on Fire and the work that we do. So that was, a, that was a, a, a thrill, I mean, to hear that. Let me tell you, the Pope asked us, you know, not to talk much about the, the stuff of the Synod, the, the really work of the Synod. So I won't do that. I'll just share a couple of just maybe overarching themes. To my mind, and, and you would guess this from if you read any of the preliminary work on the Synod, people who have felt, for different reasons, marginalized uh, from the church, that their voices have not been heard, that they want to be heard, they want a place around the table. Um, lay people especially who have felt marginalized want in around the table where decisions are made in the church. And so this whole idea of synodality, that's I think really what most people mean by it, is involving more and more people in the governance of the church. And, and my reaction, you know, we, we heard that over and over and over again, was fine, because I, I think in our country, we've had these synodal structures for a long time. I've been in three dioceses, Chicago, L.A., and now my own in Winona, Rochester. And, you know, the consultation of the laity takes place at all sorts of levels, from finance councils to, to pastoral councils to chancery offices. My own chancery office is 90% lay people, majority women. Most parish councils I know of are 90% or 100% lay people, majority women. Now, my point there is not to dismiss this concern, but to say, I do think in our country, we have a lot of what people were calling for at the Synod. Now, a point that I made often, both in the small groups and one time in the plenary session, was I get it. I, I get the desire for more people to be involved in the, in the governance of the church. But I would keep reminding folks, but for 98% of the laity, Right? I mean, so let's say all the positions that can be filled by lay people were filled in the governance of the church, you're still talking about a tiny percentage of lay people. 98.7% are meant to transform the world. Right? That the task of the laity, according to Vatican II, is to go out into the secular order. 
of finance and politics and business and entertainment and everything else and to Christify it. And so what I cautioned a few times at the Synod was there's such an odd intra preoccupation of, of how to get inside the governance of the church when I think Vatican II and the popes after Vatican II have been emphasizing odd extra, right? The laity going out into the world. So that was a theme that, that um, surfaced quite a bit. A second thing that concerned me a little bit, there was a lot of talk about mission and, you know, the mission of the church. And the church doesn't have a mission. It is a mission. All that wonderful language from Paul VI. And I think that's gotten into people's minds and hearts. They got that message, which is good. But as I read the documents and heard much of the conversation, too often I thought mission seemed to be, uh, the, you know, the amelioration of political and economic conditions in the world. Important stuff. Social justice. And I'll say more about it tonight in my talk. But I, I, I worried at times that we didn't hear the language of eternal life and grace and salvation and heaven and hell and the cross and redemption. You know, the... The, the properly supernatural dimension, and what I argued both in the, in the, at the tables and at the plenary session was, yes, the supernatural lifts up the natural, right? Aquinas says that, right? The, that uh, grace doesn't destroy nature, it, it perfects it, it elevates it. And so, yes, of course, we're more committed to social justice, we're more committed to the poor, the more we understand the supernatural dimension of the church's life. So that's a point I made I, a number of times. Those are just a couple of themes uh, I'll share with you at the moment. We're midway through the process. We'll meet again next October. Uh, we all said to the organizers of the Synod, please make it shorter next year. <laughs> because we all thought that being away from our dioceses for five weeks was a lot. So we'll see what happens next year when I think they're going to take the themes that emerged during this first round and then try to focus them. So anyway, just wanted to give you a little flavor of the Synod. Um, I'm, I'm going to publish a piece, a relatively longer piece on, on the Synod, sharing some of these ideas. It'll come out, I think, next week. Okay. And now to my talk. I love the theme you chose, witness, because it speaks to something, everybody, that is really distinctive to Christianity. Christianity is not a philosophy, though it can incorporate philosophy. It's not primarily a mysticism, though it can incorporate mysticism. It's not a religion that comes welling up out of natural experience, though it can accommodate that. Christianity is about something that happened. And there were witnesses of it. Something happened. And there were witnesses of it. Without that, Christianity falls apart. I've said before, uh, what distinguishes the Gospels from any other form of religious literature whether it's, it's Sufi poets or it's Buddhist uh, sages or Confucian philosophers, the difference is the Gospels are grabbing you by the lapels and telling you something happened. The other religions might talk about ethical principles and, and mystical intuitions and, and deep philosophical ideas, all of which are fine, but there's something sort of musing and reflective about them. Then there is the gospel. Mind you, gospel, euangelion, good news. Something happened. Something happened, and there were witnesses to it. And they were so overwhelmed by what they saw that they wanted to grab everybody by the lapels and tell them about it. That's Christianity. Now, what happened? Jesus 
happened. Yeshua, this first century Jew, they saw and heard his teaching and his preaching. They saw his healing. Above all, they saw him die and they saw him rise from the dead. Now, look at that first one, that they saw him die. It was very important for the ancient Romans, who knew how to put people to death, by the way. They were expert at it. It was very important for them that a crucifixion be public. It was meant as a deterrent. And that's why Jesus is crucified right outside the walls of Jerusalem. We say Mount Calvary, you know, it, the word just means a skull. It's like a little rise in the ground near a quarry, they think. Kind of a garbage dump area. But the idea was to crucify him right by the city gates so anyone coming and going would see him. Can you imagine, everybody, what it was like for the first followers of Jesus, especially his disciples, to see him die? I mean, how devastating it must have been. Here's the one. Think of the road to Emmaus story. You hear it echo, don't you, in that? We thought he was the one who was to rule in Israel, but, but obviously he was not. This one who I mean, claimed to be the son of God, who spoke and acted in the very person of God, the Mashiach of Israel, the anointed one, the great Davidic warrior, that's what we thought he was. And then we saw him die in this horrific way. He didn't die in his bed, you know, from a long illness. He's brutally put to death by the Romans. How utterly devastating it must have been. But then they saw something else, didn't they? These witnesses, these first witnesses. They saw Jesus risen from the dead. You know, I just came across this a couple days ago. Graham Greene, the great Catholic novelist, right? By the end of his life, he'd been sort of alienated from the church. But, you know, his great novels, The Power and the Glory and The End of the Affair. And, you know, he's a Catholic writer. He said one of the things that led him to accept Christian faith was the account in John's Gospel of the two disciples running to the tomb. Remember that? That John and Peter run to the tomb and John outran him and got there first but then waited for Peter. And Graham Greene said, such a weird thing to put into a story unless it was vividly remembered. The, the peculiarity of that moment when these witnesses came and first saw the empty tomb. You remember too the detail in John of the, of the burial cloth and, and the the head covering rolled up by itself. Why would you, if you're just telling a mythic story, why would you include a detail like that? Unless it was vividly remembered. One of the great clues, I think, to the reality of the resurrection, it's in Acts chapter 10. We always read it on Easter Sunday. One of those early charismatic uh, proclamations. You know the things that happened up in Galilee and, and the baptism that was offered by John and then the stuff that happened down in Judea? You remember all that stuff? That's how the speech begins. It's like if I were to say to you, you know, I started the other day, I was up in, uh, in Baltimore, then I drove to Washington and got on a plane and flew here to Orlando. Would you think for a second I was telling you a myth or a legend? No, no, you, you say, oh, and what happened next? So you're Baltimore, then Washington, then Orlando. Yeah, then what happened? You would assume correctly, I was telling you about something that happened, something real. Well, that's exactly how that charismatic proclamation commences. All those things about Jesus of Nazareth. And then there's, there's this line that, it always takes my breath away. Attend to it this coming Easter when you hear it. We who ate and drank with him after his resurrection from the dead. Let that sink in. 
So he's talking about something real. Galilee, then Judea, John the Baptist. Remember all that? And then the Jesus. Yeah, yeah, remember all that? We, we ate and drank with him after his resurrection from the dead. That's not how myth makers talk. That's not how people who are trading in legends talk. You know how they talk, by the way? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But see, that's exactly the clue correctly that, that I'm now going to tell you an archetypal tale. I'm going to tell you a legend, a myth. It's like uh, once upon a time. That's my clue that, well, this didn't really happen. It, it's an archetypal story. And then there's the Gospels that don't talk that way. They say things like, you know, it, it was Pontius Pilate who put him to death. And, and isn't it wonderful? Every Sunday we repeat that. He was crucified under Pontius Pilatus, a, 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 a datable Roman governor. We have physical evidence of his existence. How powerful that is. This Jesus we're talking about, he was crucified under Pontius Pilatus, and we ate and drank with him after his resurrection from the dead. We are witnesses to it. You know, I thought of this, everybody, often when I was in Rome. Uh, I stayed at the North American College. I don't know if you know where that is. That's on the Janiculum Hill, so it's just a little bit south of St. Peter's. And the, the NAC, we call it, the North American NAC, is built on the top of the geniculum. And then on the top of the NAC, the fifth floor, they have these guest rooms where, where bishops tend to stay when they go there. So my room, lovely place, and these windows that look beautifully out on St. Peter's Basilica. So like at night, with the lights on it, I would just, I would just muse at the window looking at the dome of St. Peter's. And I often thought, underneath that dome lies Shimeon Bariona, this fisherman from Capernaum, who one day met Yeshua from Nazareth. And Yeshua gave him a new name, Simon, Shimeon Bariona, Simon, son of John. From now on, you're going to be called Kephas, Rocky, rendered in Greek as Petros and Latin as Petrus, Peter. And on that rock, I'm going to build my church. And, and by God, it, it occurred to me night after night as I gazed out at that dome. There he is. Under that dome, there he is. Petrus, Kephas, Shimeon Bariona, who knew Jesus, who was a witness to his death and resurrection who ate and drank with him after his resurrection from the dead. And he lies there underneath the most beautiful grave marker in the world. And that's what St. Peter's Basilica is, isn't it? It's saying, Peter's here, Peter's here, Peter's here. This guy that knew Jesus. You know that line from the first letter of John? He said, I speak to you of the word of life. Well, okay, I can imagine any philosopher or religious mystic saying that. But then he adds, the word of life that we looked upon, that we saw with our eyes and touched with our hands. Now that's the difference, everybody. A witness, a witness who saw him, touched him, ate and drank with him after his resurrection from the dead. That's the still shocking revolutionary novelty upon which Christianity rests. Don't let it turn into a vague philosophy. Don't let them turn Christianity into one religion among many. It's based upon witnesses who saw the resurrection. They saw Jesus risen from the dead. Now, what makes that something more than just, wow, what an extraordinary one-off event that is? It's because they interpreted it right away in light of Israel. What is Israel, the people Israel, but God's rescue operation, right? After sin had, had messed with the beauty and integrity of God's creation, he sends a rescue operation, this people Israel, whom he's going to shape according to his mind and heart. 
gave them covenant law, Torah, temple, prophecy, all these great institutions. And then Israel dreams that one day a Mashiach, an anointed one, would come who would represent the fulfillment of all of the institutions of Israel, who would be the temple in its fullness, the place of right praise. He'd be the fulfillment of law and covenant. He'd be the prophet par excellence. He'd be David par excellence, who would finally deal with the enemies of Israel. What they saw, and Paul, Paul, of course, who was Shaul, Rabbi Shaul, until he saw him. Revisit Paul's letters sometime. Read them as though you read them for the first time. Here's this Shaul on fire with the traditions of his, of his fathers. He's an he's a on fire Israelite. And he wants to do damage to these Christians because they're making all these crazy claims. And so off he goes, the Acts of the Apostles says, breathing murderous threats. And then he saw him. He witnessed the resurrected Jesus. He saw him. And you know, everybody, I, even from a sheerly historical standpoint, I don't know how else to explain how you get from Shaul breathing murderous threats to the Apostle Paul. How do you get there? How do you explain that? He witnessed something. He witnessed the same thing Peter did, same thing John did, same thing the apostles did. And they understood something. God has dealt with the enemies of Israel, but not in the way they expected. That Roman cross would represent every lousy, negative, cruel, hateful aspect of the sinful world. This symbol. You know, if, if you, you get on our wrong side, we're going to hang you on this thing until you die. And it's about the worst way to die that human beings have ever devised. And so this thing was meant to terrify the world. It summed up everything wrong with humanity in our cruelty and violence and hatred. Yeshua, this friend of Peter and John and James, was crucified on, on one of these awful instruments of torture. And God raised him from the dead. Which means what, everybody? That God's love and mercy are more powerful than anything that's in the world. More powerful than Rome, than anything Rome can throw at them more powerful than any hatred, any cruelty, any violence, any injustice. Our God is more powerful. And that's why, and this, this process begins even in the New Testament period, when Paul talks about, I, I displayed before your eyes Jesus crucified. That, that's a weird thing to say in the first century. What do you mean you're displaying someone crucified? That's like the ugliest, grossest, most, most disgusting thing you could show. But look how we still do it. Here I'm standing before you as a bishop of the Catholic Church, and I got this thing in, in gold. <laughs> because that's a taunt. See what I'm saying? It's meant, I wear that as a taunt. We say, well, it's just a nice religious symbol. No, 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 it's a taunt. You think this scares us? We're going to put gold on it. <laughs> because we realize God is more powerful than this awful thing. Think of that, everyone, when you, when you see a cross. That's what it means. You know, I had the privilege a few months ago, I was over in London, and uh, I gave a talk at the, at the Parliament. Not in the Parliament, but it was in the Parliament building area. And um, at the end of it, I reminded them, I said, you know, have you guys looked recently at the Union Jack, which flies over the Parliament houses? The Union Jack is a is a confluence of three crosses, all right? So think about that for a second. Fluttering over the, the uh, government center of this great world power is the cross on which this young Jewish rabbi was put to death in the first century. How weird that is, isn't it? 
How strange that is. But it's done there too, if you properly understand it, as a taunt. God's mercy is greater than anything that's in the world. That's what they witnessed. That's what they witnessed to. That's what we still need to witness to. Okay, that's the first part of my talk. <laughs> but I, don't worry, it's going to be quick, the second part. So you say, okay, Bishop, I think I get that. I think I get these sort of lofty ideas about the nature of Christianity. But what about me? What about my life? Well, let me do the translation now. Maybe you've heard me say, I've quoted a number of times, Dorothy Day, the foundress of the Catholic Worker Movement, said, everything a baptized Christian does every day, everything should be directly or indirectly related to the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. I remember I read that years ago, and, and it's one of those lines that just changes you. Everything a baptized Christian does every day should be directly or indirectly related to the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. You see the translation now. What does this mean that they witness to? That God's mercy conquers all evil. God's love and mercy are greater than anything that's in the world. So our job now, as we witness to Christ, is to become channels of that mercy to the world. That's our job. That's Christianity. That's what it looks like when you translate these loftier ideas into life. So what I want to do, I'll do it real briefly. Don't worry, I won't go plowing through each one. And, you know, if you don't know the corporal and spiritual works, just Google them or ask Siri. Just say, hey, Siri, what are the corporal and spiritual works? And they'll pop up. But I just want to say a word about at least some of them. The corporal works, the first three I'll group together. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, and clothe the naked. And I love about that. I love how concrete those are. That's a word our, our present pope uses a lot, I think, correctly. The concrete. Oh, I'm a person of mercy. Yeah, that's nice, fancy talk. But on the ground, what does mercy look like? It looks like feeding the hungry, giving drink to thirsty people, and clothing naked people. You know, I lived in... Um, Santa Barbara, California, for six years when I was auxiliary out there. So one of the most exclusive, beautiful places to live in the whole country. Oprah and Prince Harry lived about 15 minutes from where I lived. But I guarantee you, I know this for a fact, about 10 minutes from where I lived, there were also hungry and thirsty people. It's true of everybody in this room. I don't care where you live. I don't care how exclusive a neighborhood. Ten minutes from where you live, there are hungry and thirsty people. What are we doing now to feed them and give them drink? Soup kitchens, shelters for the homeless, those exist within easy striking distance of everyone in this room. How much time are we spending there? How many donations are we giving? When we prepare a meal, can we double what we need, freeze half of that, and then bring it down to the homeless shelter or the soup kitchen? You know, clothe the naked. Um, I think you can do a lot of interesting spiritual work when you go into a, in your closet. Go into your closet, like everybody in this room. It's true for me. Um, there are a lot of things in that closet I haven't worn in probably four years. <laughs> I mean, someone once said there, there should be an expiration date on clothes like there is on food. Like, if you've not worn that thing in a year, it, it's time to give it away. I propose that as a spiritual exercise to you. Go into your closet and look at your shoes and shirts and pants or dresses or whatever you got in there. How much do I really need? And can I give the rest to those who do desperately need clothing, the naked who are among us even now. You know that line has been attributed to both Ambrose of Milan and John Chrysostom. 
If you have two shirts in your closet, one belongs to you. The other belongs to the man who has no shirt. One of those lines, again, that changes your life when it sinks in. Think of it again. There are two shirts in your closet. Uh huh. One belongs to you. The other belongs to the person with no shirt. You know, when Pope Francis, he got, he got criticized a lot for this, but unjustly, when he spoke some years ago about the universal destination of goods. Remember that? People said he's a Marxist. Eh, it's not Marx, that's Aquinas, right? That we have a right to private ownership, says Aquinas. But when it comes to the use of our private property, we must always have the common good first in mind. That's not Marx, that's Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas stands in the tradition going back to Jesus and to Isaiah and to Amos and Hosea and the Hebrew prophets. Clothe the naked. There are people within 10 minutes of where you live, I guarantee you, who need clothes. Can we do something to address that problem? Next one, shelter the homeless. Gosh, when I was in LA, I, I started there in 2015, um, and you'd walk around downtown LA near the cathedral and you'd see a lot of homeless people. But six years later when I left, I think the problem was 10 times worse, 20 times worse maybe. Homeless people all over the place in California. But you know that, every city, every major city in our country now. That's a very real pressing need, calling out for works of mercy. Go back to Dorothy Day again. She said, writing back in the 30s, that she didn't like Roosevelt's New Deal. How come? Because it, it made everything a government program instead of something that we should be doing ourselves. It makes it more challenging, not less, right? What are we doing to address that issue, to shelter the homeless? Next one, visit the imprisoned. Again, what, what are we doing? We're embodying this, this taunt, that God's mercy is greater than anything in the world. So don't believe it when they say, no, no, these are intractable, impossible problems. God's love is more powerful. So let's get to work. Let's join his army. Visit the imprisoned. My model here is Johnny Cash, right? Johnny Cash who played in prisons a lot. And when he was asked one time, how come you play in prisons? He said, well, first they're the best audience. <laughs> But then he said, secondly, and it's an entirely satisfactory answer, it seems to me. He said, because I'm a Christian. Right, it's a good answer. Christians visit the imprisoned. Um, when I was in California, there was a, there was a, a youth detention center in Oxnard. Um, and you'd see these kids there like 15, 16, covered in tattoos. They had committed violent crimes. And I remember one of the chaplains there told me, there are third and fourth generation gangbangers in that prison. Their grandfather, their great grandfather was a gang member, you know? On the other extreme, I used to go to the Lompoc Federal Penitentiary, it's about 45 minutes from my home. And uh, you know who was there for a time? The Watergate criminals. I think Charles Colson and Halderman Ehrlichman were in the Lompoc <laughs> Penitentiary. Uh, my point is, Trust me, wherever you live, within striking distance, there are the imprisoned. Do we visit, help them, intercede for them? And of course, not just those in federal penitentiaries, but people imprisoned by, their, by illness, imprisoned in their loneliness. We know imprisoned people all around us. Do we visit them? Relatedly visit the sick, you know? all kinds of people we know, right, right around us who are sick. Empowered by the cross, become a witness of mercy. The last one, I think of my dear father, uh, bury the dead. Um, my father is a good Irishman and went to a lot of wakes. And when he would come home from the wake, he would almost invariably say, we were little kids, he would say, corporal work of mercy. And I think it's the first time I heard the term, corporal work of mercy. He must have learned that in Catholic grade school. But it got deep into his heart that when you went to awake, what were you doing? You were helping to bury the dead. Yep, that's a work of mercy. Can we follow up, though? We all know people who've recently lost a loved one. Can we help them continue that process of burying the dead? 
with our caring visits and our, and our concern. So those are the seven corporal works of mercy. That's what witnesses do, people that believe in the power of the cross. Now I'll close with this, a little reflection on the spiritual works of mercy. First one, counsel the doubtful. Now listen, everybody. We're going through a crisis right now of young people disaffiliating from our church. We know that. I've talked about it a lot. What do you hear from them time and again? I never had my questions answered. I, I had a lot of doubts about religion. You know, it seems to be at odds with science, and it seems like a lot of nonsense, and I asked questions and no one had answers. And I think, you know, they're not lying about that. That was a real failure of our church that we were not there to perform a work of mercy, which indeed it is, to counsel the doubtful. If people are wrestling with the great questions and we're not there as elders in the community to help them, that's failing in a work of mercy. Relatedly, the second one is instruct the ignorant. I used to tell my students at Mundelein, now that's what I do <laughs> as your teacher. They never really cared for that. But, you know, I, I love the fact that this is seen properly as a work of mercy. You know, that, that wonderful, and any teacher in the room knows this, that when you present something in such a way that, that someone's mind and heart open up, and you teach them physics or chemistry or history or whatever it is, but when you instruct the ignorant, you, you open their minds and hearts to, to the world of value, epistemic value, aesthetic value, moral value. That's a work of mercy. That's a work of mercy because one thing that God's love conquers is the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of self-absorption. And when you as a teacher, either formally or informally, can open that up, you bet that's a work of mercy. Third one, admonish sinners. That's something witnesses do. Monio in Latin means to warn, right? To admonish a sinner is to warn a sinner. It's a work of mercy, isn't it? Someone's heading toward a cliff and we don't say a thing. Shame on us. Everyone in this room, myself included, we know people who've been going down a very negative path of self-destruction. And if we, and again, fellow sinners in this room, we love this approach to sit in judgment, you know, like the church lady, we sit in judgment on sinners. To admonish sinners, it's not that. It's not judgment. That's cheap and easy. Admonishing a sinner is getting down into the, into the muck and the mud of someone's dysfunction and be willing to walk with them, not just to... to uh, scold them from a distance, but to warn them and to walk with them, get them backed away from the cliff, whether it's forms of addiction, whether it's types of sin. And may I say this, everybody, in, in a kind of a self-reproach, one of the many faces of the worst crisis in the history of the American church, namely the clergy sex abuse crisis, is a failure in this. And it's priests have to bear a lot of responsibility. Bishops, too. A failure to admonish sinners. Did we see things and look the other way? Did we see things and not warn? So that's a work of mercy. That's not being judgmental. It's a work of mercy when you warn a sinner. I bet everybody in this room right now can think of somebody that you know who's, who's hurtling down a very bad path. What's the merciful thing to do? Relatedly, fourth work of spiritual work of mercy, forgive wrongs. Gosh, how, how central to the teaching of Jesus forgiveness was. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Everyone in this room, I'd be willing to wager, every single person, myself included, there's somebody that we need to forgive and we can't bring ourselves to do it, right? There's some wrong that was done to us and we're still nursing it. We're, we're still kind of quasi enjoying it and we're still, still holding a grudge against the person that caused it. How much human suffering is caused by this? 
failure in mercy. That's what forgiveness is. It's not justice. See, justice is just kind of eye for an eye. You know, let's, sit, let's get the thing correctly balanced again. That's justice. But see, mercy mocks justice, the letter of James says, right? A work of mercy is to go beyond justice. Think of someone right now that you need to forgive. Do it as a work of mercy. Fifth, comfort the afflicted. In a way, boy, that's maybe the easiest one because there's so much affliction, right? All around us. Physical affliction, psychological affliction, spiritual affliction, financial affliction. There are afflicted people everywhere. Do we take the time to comfort them? That's a work of mercy. That's what witnesses to the risen Christ do. Last two, here's, here's really my favorite of the spiritual works of mercy. I think about it a lot. Bear patiently the troublesome. <laughs> there are a lot of troublesome people, right? <laughs> there are a lot of, let me give you another word, annoying people. <laughs> Whether you're on an airplane and someone's talking too much and annoying you, or whatever it is, there are plenty of annoying people around. There's a line from Jose Maria Escriva I've always loved. He said, instead of saying, gosh, that person's annoying me, you should say, gosh, that person is sanctifying me. <laughs> right? That for some reason, the Lord has sent this troublesome person to call forth from me greater patience and greater love and maybe, maybe what I'm finding so annoying is something wrong in me, right, that needs correction, that needs improvement. Um, don't miss the opportunity of being sanctified by annoying people. Rather, see it as an act of mercy. And again, every day, this is easy one to find, right? Every day. Last one. Pray for the living and the dead. Now, can I just give one little angle maybe we haven't thought about enough about the crisis of people staying away from mass? So I've said, and I stand by it, it's a spiritual disaster when you stay away from the source and summit of the Christian life, when you regularly stay away from a connection to God, when you say, I, I don't care about the mass anymore, is that bad for you? Yes, it's very bad for you. But with this in mind, staying away from Mass, which is the greatest form of prayer, is a failure to do a work of mercy. Maybe the Mass is not primarily for you. Maybe your going to Mass is for the sake of the person that you are praying for at that Mass. A living person, sure. Or maybe someone that's died. And that your attendance at Mass and your prayer at Mass is benefiting both the living and the dead. Therefore, when you stay away from Mass, you're failing in this great work of mercy, to pray. Remember a line from uh, Merton, Seven Story Mountain, I've never forgotten. As a young kid, he's exploring these uh, ruins of medieval monasteries in the south of France, and he's kind of exulting in how mournfully beautiful they are. But then he says, of course, he's writing from within the walls of a Trappist monastery. He said, I wonder now how many of those medieval monks prayed me where I am today. And it's a beautiful line, it's, and I've never forgotten it since I read it. But it speaks to this, that the prayers we offer now, who knows the effects they're having? Maybe long after we're gone. But staying away from prayer, that's a failure in mercy. I remember when I was at Mundelein and students would come to me and say, oh, Father, I'm, I'm finding praying in the office, you know, it's just so difficult, I'm not getting anything out of it. I say, I don't care. I don't care if you're not getting something. You're not praying for yourself primarily. When you open up that office as a priest, you're praying for the church. 
You know that, that wonderful, mournful um, psalm? We pray it at uh, night prayer every, every Friday. And it's the most despairing psalm about someone that's just lost and friendless and they feel like they're lying among the dead and their only companion is darkness. It's just terribly dark psalm. And years ago, a very wise teacher said to me, when you're praying that psalm, maybe you don't feel that way. But trust me, somebody right now in the body of Christ feels exactly that way. And you're praying for him or you're praying for her. To pray for the living and the dead, everybody, that's not something trivial, not just having nice thoughts about someone. That's a work of mercy. Okay, so what do witnesses to this uh, cross do? Yeah, I'm, I'm a successor of the apostles as a bishop. That's the, the title that moves me the most. As a bishop, I'm a successor of the apostles. When we were sitting in the synod, we were in the Paul VI audience hall, which is just south of the Bernini Colonnade, just south of the Basilica. You know what stood there in the first century was the Circus of Nero. And that's where Peter was put to death. He was crucified there, legend says, upside down. And you know the obelisk, which stands now in the center of St. Peter's Square, that was in the uh, Circus of Nero. Likely, it's one of the very last things St. Peter saw. The witness, the witness who, who saw Jesus die, saw him risen from the dead, and then bequeathed that great witness to the world. And it's carried all the way down over 20 centuries to Orlando, Florida. And this gold cross, which is a sign that God's mercy is more powerful than anything in the world, and there's the program, everybody. To join Jesus' army is to do the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. So let's get to it. God bless you all.